This program is made possible by the loyal financial support of the friends and partners of Family Policy Institute. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Good evening and welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. My guest on the program tonight is Steve Swart, the ACDP MP in Parliament and member of the Justice and Correctional Services Portfolio Committee, many others as well. But for this program, we're going to be talking about justice issues, hate crimes bill, and many other things. So Steve, welcome to the program. Great to have you back. Thank you, Errol, and good evening to your viewers. Looking forward to share some good insight into what's going on in Parliament with you. Yeah, absolutely. You always give us in a good insight, Steve. So, so I want to thank you for your time. Uh, just kicking right off, we want to talk about the hate crimes and hate speech bill. Uh, the full name of it is the Prevention and Combating of Hate Speech and Hate Crimes Bill. We'll just refer to it as the Hate Crimes Bill. Uh, that has been um, you know, out for comment now. Uh, the deadline was the 1st of October, uh, but this was first put out for comment in 2016. And me, you and I did a video uh, uh, on that, asking people to make submissions. And I believe there was about 76,000 submissions to, to the Department of Justice on this hate crimes bill. So you can see there's a lot of interest, a lot of concern about it. What are your concerns, uh, Steve? Well, I think we first need to separate the two issues. The hate crimes aspect is something that we all across the board support. Where crimes, murder, rape are committed, where there is a hate motive behind it, it should be an aggravating circumstance. However, the hate speech aspect is something which you and many others ourselves as the ACDB were very concerned about because it was so broadly defined. And that was the reason why many religious organizations uh, journalists, other people sent in submissions to say that it was too broadly defined. And in our engagement with the department, with the deputy minister, we are grateful that the definition was amended to a certain degree to allow an exemption for religious organizations. But we still said it did not go far enough. And then it was basically put on the back burner because of the Kualani judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal. And then that was heard again by the Constitutional Court uh, where it brought out its findings. So now it's back before the Justice Portfolio Committee with the Kulani judgment having now come out and given clear definitions of what hate speech is. And that is why the Justice Committee now, on the recommendation of the ACDP, has invited public comments in view of the Kulani judgment. So our concerns are still that the definition of the bill as before the committee is still too wide. And in fact, it is wider than is required by the Constitutional Court in the Kulani judgment. Secondly, the aspect, whilst we welcome the religious exemption for organizations, we don't believe it goes wide enough to cover individuals that might be evangelizing on a street corner and then could be accused of hate speech. So we definitely believe that that needs to be tightened up and rest assured that the ACDP will be promoting those issues. And we thank God for favor in the committee that we have been able to persuade members of the portfolio committee from the majority party to hear compelling legal arguments and the concerns of the religious community in these amendments. Yeah, Steve, do you think this, this uh, bill will ultimately go to the constitutional court? Because if the, the, the definitions of hate speech is too broad and it's going to concern in, you know, even the media, uh, journalists and all kinds of people, do you think there's going to be a challenge uh, to it, or do you think that the Department of Justice, the Justice Portfolio Committee, are, we, where you serve, will, will tighten up those definitions? We're really hoping that they will. Uh, because it has such far-reaching consequences, we, we believe that um, they will look at that very carefully. But should they not, then clearly there is a possibility of it being taken to the Constitutional Court to bring it, the bill in line with what the Polani judgment states. Okay, so the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Steve, was uh, the Papuda Amendment Bill. That's the prevention of unfair, um, uh, just say what they're Prevention of unfair discrimination, and yes. Yeah. And, and that, that, yeah. 
So that is a very far-reaching piece of legislation already in its present form. So the Department of Justice has now come with a number of amendments to that bill, which would remember that was passed in terms of Section 9 of the Constitution. Yes. And there have been, so it's not before Parliament yet, but the proposed amendments have caused an outrage because basically any person can require anything in terms of the Equality Bill in terms of this proposal. For example, you're a pastor and you have a member that says, no, but I want to be, it's my equal right to become the pastor or become the leader of this church. So there are extreme circumstances that can result in the wording of this bill that clearly are untenable because we do not have an equal society. You can't demand as an employee that you must be the owner of a business, for example. And I think that is our concern. If you start going through it, we have made a submission as to the broad implications of this proposal. And it's unworkable as it is at the moment. And so I'm already engaging with the ministry. But I think it's very important, as we have done in our um, submission, to re-emphasize that the, the Constitutional Court has already said in the Faree judgment that in the open and democratic society contemplated by the Constitution, the religious beliefs held by the great majority of South Africans must be taken seriously. And we believe it has not happened in this situation, in this uh, matter of these amendments. They are far-reaching, they're unworkable, and basically they allow anyone to demand equal uh, resources, equal opportunities, where we know that in the nature of society, in the nature of organizations, that we can't all be leaders. We can't all be business owners. There are those that, yes, there must be equality, but as it has been set out in the present legislation, it is being implemented, it is being enforced. We cannot have allow a situation which is almost um, a socialist situation where, or a communist situation where everyone is equal, um, that everyone has equal access to everything. It's just unworkable. You can't walk into a church and demand that you must now be the pastor in terms of the Equality Act. Absolutely. So if you look at the hate crimes and hate speech bill and the Papuda Amendment bill, and you put it all together, um, Steve, are you seeing like I am, the hand of the sexual rights movement in this? Because there's been a lot of criticism of the church preaching the gospel on sexual sin uh, and saying that the church has blood on its hands and, you know, they cannot preach that anymore. So maybe the hate speech bill and the Papuda Amendment bill is mechanisms to silence the church so that we cannot preach the gospel anymore, any longer, because there is, it, it's been said, there's this agenda to silence the church, to silence the preaching of the Bible, calling it hate speech uh, when it comes to sexual sin, uh, sins and other things like that. So there it does appear to be a move where the hate speech bill and the Papuda Amendment Bill is kind of bringing a lot of pressure to bear on the church. Do you agree? Well, I think before the exemptions were included um, in the hate speech bill, that was definitely the case. But thankful to uh, thanks to organizations like yourself, like other organizations, uh, like the ACDP, that has engaged on these issues and, ex and highlighted the implications. And remember what the Constitutional Court, what I just read about, the rights of religious communities must be taken seriously and engage in as salt and light um, to influence the process. Thankfully, those exemptions have now been put in place, but we've got to be eternally vigilant. That's the classic saying, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And so, yes, they, there are definitely secular movements against us. There's definitely agendas that we should not speak out against sexual sin and try to silence that under the guise of hate speech. Um, I think we need to be very sensitive, but thankfully, as we in Parliament engage with the members of Parliament and say these are the consequences, we've been able to limit the damage, but clearly we need to be continually vigilant and protect churches, protect organizations from expressing their views. We've got religious freedom in South Africa. It's very important. We've got those rights of religious freedom, rights of expression, um, and rights freedom of belief, and those are protected in terms of our constitution. And so we need to be, and I agree with you, we need to be very vigilant when any steps are taken against them. 
So Steve, what is the next step? So we had the final kind of uh, input from the public. Uh, first of uh, October was the deadline. And now this bill, is. does it become a white paper? And is there going to be any further public participation in the hate crimes and hate speech bill? No, so remember the bill was before the previous parliament and it was reintroduced into the sixth parliament. And so it's been before parliament, but awaiting the constitutional court judge. So the bill is now before the Justice uh, and, and Correctional Services Portfolio Committee. We invited public comments. The ACDB insisted on public comments and, and they were invited. So it comes back to, we now engage with the department on the public comments and we as legislators now go through the bill, go through the, and, and there are a few tweaking. It's not dramatic. But remember, our initial view was it's not necessary. Hate speech is covered sufficiently in other legislation and in terms of the Constitution, even in terms of computer and other issues. But now, given the fact that the, um, the, 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 the majority party, the ANC, want to continue with this, now we've got to limit the impact of it. And that is how we've done it, by ensuring that there is a religious exception, but again, tighten it up even further to ensure individuals are protected and bring in the definition of harm, the definition of hate speech into line with what the Constitutional Court has. And that is going to be engaged in the committee session. So it's crucial for us to have an appreciation of the importance of having members of parliament who are there to argue these positions, like the ACDP, I'll be at the forefront and I'm honoured to be the longest serving member of the Justice Portfolio Committee and have favour with other members and being able to persuade them that it is for the common good that we do tighten up this legislation. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. And we thank God that you are there because this is a critical piece of legislation. I think most viewers uh, can see that because uh, there are agendas behind this. There's outside foreign influences involved in this. We've got to understand that. And so we've got to fight for our rights and, and, and ensure that religious speech and religious freedoms is preserved. So, uh, Steve, I want to talk uh, to you. Uh, we're going for a break now, but after the break, I want to talk about the vaccine mandates or potential vaccine mandates. Uh, how do you see that uh, working out and a few other things? So, uh, more with Steve Swat, ACDP MP, after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back to the program. I'm speaking to Steve Swat, ACDP MP in Parliament and also a member of the Justice Portfolio Committee. So, Steve, welcome back to the program. We've been talking about the hate speech and hate crimes bill. We've been talking about the Papuda Amendment Bill. And these are bills that is going to outlaw hate speech. And again, we must agree that hate speech must be outlawed. Hate crimes must be outlawed. If, if anybody's harming somebody on the basis of their skin color, their race, ethnicity, gender. Uh, we cannot tolerate those kind of things. And we thank God, you know, there's been a lot of these uh, attacks on people because of who they are, immutable, immutable characteristics. And there must be a law against that to deal with these kind of things. So we support that fully. But what we don't support, obviously, is uh, criminalizing the Bible, criminalizing religious speech, because certain groups don't agree that the Bible says certain kinds of acts are sinful. And we have to preach that. We cannot change the Bible and you cannot declare it hate speech. It is what it is. It's the word of God. And, and we as Christians must stand up and protect that because the, the Bible is never preached in, in hate. It's actually love. It's God's love to tell people to repent of things that harm them. So, so it can never, ever be considered hate speech. Uh, but... Absolutely. But now, so, so um, that is with the Justice Portfolio Committee at the moment. You guys are going to be working through that and be waiting to see what the final bill is going to look like uh, because of the broad de definition of what hate speech is. And we're hoping that they're going to tighten that up. But then we come to another uh, concerning issue, and that is vaccine mandates. There's been a lot of discussion in the media about that, where government is going to mandate vaccines. Everybody must have a vaccine. And of course, uh, what comes into play here is freedom of choice. I mean, the abortion industry is always saying, my body, my choice. So bodily integrity and freedom of choice is a constitutional protected uh, uh, right. How are they going to go, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, go over that hurdle, number one? And number two, 
We don't have enough vaccines in the country, so how's government going to mandate that anyway, Steve? Well, the issue from the ACDB's perspective is, let us make it very clear, we are not opposed to people or vaccines where people choose to take a vaccine if they know that it is safe, they know what the contents is, they know um, they are given advice as to contraindications, whether they've got underlying conditions and the impact that it will have, and they are able to give informed consent. That is an absolute key aspect when it comes to any medical procedure. However, as we know, this is an experimental vaccine still, and we are deeply concerned about the talk of mandatory vaccines, in particular from the private sector. Our leader, Reverend Kenneth Meshwe, had an engagement with President Ramaphosa recently where President Ramaphosa emphasized that there would not be mandatory vaccines. However, that a directive had been given by the Department of Labor as to how they should engage with employees, and there should be consultations, and there should be space for those people that choose not to be vaccinated. Clearly, if you are vaccinated, you should not be discriminated against. Similarly, if you are not, if you choose not to be vaccinated, you should not be discriminated against. So we are deeply concerned about the impact and the, the numbers of people and organizations that are now compelling their employees to be vaccinated. We believe it is unconstitutional, it is unlawful, it is not permissible, and we welcome the fact that the South African Human Rights Commission has now come out very strongly, unambiguously, and said that there is no space for mandatory vaccines in terms of our existing constitution and the existing laws. And in fact, they've invited people that have been forced to vaccinate to contact them, and they will raise the issues. So we, from the ACDP side, are also involved in uh, taking legal advice. You'll recall that we also looked uh, in the issue of uh, ivermectin, alternative treatments, vitamin C, vitamin D for COVID-19. We obtained a court order compelling the government to roll out to make ivermectin more easily accessible. That issue is still being appealed at the moment, but we will take every step to protect citizens from the choice they wish to make. If they choose to be vaccinated, that's fine. If they choose not to be vaccinated, they need similarly to be protected. And we're deeply concerned now that there's talk about a vaccine passport which is an indirect method of putting pressure on people. In other words, if you want to go and watch soccer or rugby, you have to have a vaccine passport. Yeah, and that we need to oppose as well because it goes against our freedoms. Yeah, and doesn't that remind you, Steve? We need to understand this in a role. Steve, sorry, um, doesn't that remind you of the pass, the bomba, that you needed a pass Absolutely. to go to certain places? And so think about it, the ANC government is bringing back the past and, and it will allow you certain privileges if you are vaccinated and it reminds you of the, the past and the dreaded past laws of the past. Um, so, I, you know, this is crazy. Again, Steve, we're not anti-vax, um, but, um, but we are for choice, freedom of choice, because if people want to take the vac vaccine, they are free to do so. If people don't want to take the vaccine, they're also free to do so. Nobody must be forced by government to put something in their body that they are not 100% sure. They need more information, give them more information. But vaccine passports and mandatory vaccines and everything is just unconstitutional. Unconstitutional, it's, it's tyranny. I, you know, the, the pushing people and forcing people to do things against their will never works. There's always been a, 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 a huge response to those kinds of uh, policies. Absolutely. And so we've mentioned that issue of the Dompass. In, in part of the Dompass, um, members of the ACDPR leadership, uh, Reverend Kenneth Meshwe and, of course, Wayne Tring, that were victims of apartheid, would, and said this is exactly what is intended with this. And you've got to see it against the backdrop of the lockdowns, where many irrational rules were taken, regulations were taken, that destroyed businesses, that destroyed individuals, uh, uh, unemployment has skyrocketed, and now you've got to see that on top of this. There are alternatives, and we will insist that individuals have the right not to be vaccinated. And we've got many people that have been vaccinated that say, look, 
we support your view on we we've been vaccinated but we are objecting to anyone being forced to be vaccinated and yeah. must be freedom of choice and so we say freedom we say liberty liberty from the lockdowns liberty from any form of mandatory vaccines that's never been done before in, uh, in history now i've had vaccines to go overseas uh, we've had vaccines when we grew up um, they've been very useful this vaccine obviously one's got to be able to give informed consent and as we've mentioned before but it cannot be forced upon the citizens and we need to stand up and say no we refuse to accept this we refuse to accept no to obligatory jabs if you choose to have it that's 100 percent. many acdp people have chosen to be vaccinated but we are saying no mandatory vaccines at all amen amen i agree with that uh, steve so in the few minutes we have left i want to talk about uh, the prostitution laws now in uh, 29 2009 sorry um the south african law reform commission commissioned by the department of justice did a nine-year study on prostitution law reform. And the result of that study, the final report, uh, they said they don't recommend decriminalized prostitution. Uh, the, some of the major reasons for that is already women are, are there's a lot of violence and uh, exploitation of women and young girls. Uh, the poverty levels, the unemployment levels would be a disaster if the, the sex industry was decriminalized in South Africa. But you and I know there's a lot of outside influences and forces, the George Soros associated uh, organizations and all kinds of leftist groups operating in South Africa, UNESCO, UNICEF, all these people is pressurizing our government to decriminalize prostitution, even though our society uh, um, says no to it. Uh, have you heard anything in the Justice Department about re-looking at the laws on prostitution, which is currently uh, illegal to be a prostitute in South Africa. So there's nothing before us in the Justice Portfolio Committee at the moment, but we hear in the corridors, we hear that, uh, for example, the ANC Women's Caucus has now called for the decriminalization of prostitution. We are totally opposed to that, given the high levels of gender-based violence we already have, given the breakdown of our family units that we already have, given HIV AIDS, given the impacts of that our society is in a moral state of decay. And how can we allow decriminalization of prostitution, which breaks down our family units in the main, and of course can spread HIV and AIDS. So we are totally opposed to that. But however, we are also aware of the allegations that prostitutes are being abused. And of course, that the police abuse them. That's a separate issue. There are laws to protect every individual. If they are being abused, assaulted, the existing laws must protect them. But we cannot decriminalize prostitution given the impact that it will have on our society that is already in a state of moral decay. We must protect our family values. And so our attitude has been very clear right from the word go. We will oppose any bill or any amendment to any legislation that would seek to decriminalize prostitution. So, Steve, um, you know, decriminalized prostitution, we've, we've looked at research in a number of countries that have gone that way. And what we found is it hasn't altered anything for the prostitutes themselves, for the women trapped in the sex, uh, sex industry. Nothing improved for them. What it is actually decriminalized prostitution is a gift to, to brothel owners, to organized crime, to pimps. They are the people that benefit, not the woman. So I, I, what, you know, we, and, and the Law Reform Commission uh, report, final report, pointed out all these issues. So, you know, if government is looking at that and the, the ANC Women's League that apparently stands up for women and protect women, how could they, the most abusive and exploitative industry in the world, how would they call for the decriminalization of something that really treats women as slaves? Absolutely. And I think that they are out of touch with, the woman on the ground. We recently, um, in, in an attempt to fight gender-based violence, we looked at tightening up laws such as the Sexual Offences Act, such as the Domestic Violence Act, such as the Minimum Sentencing Act, and many of the aspects relating to the uh, criminalization of prostitution uh, is contained in these pieces of legislation. Thankfully, not one piece was amended to promote the decriminalization of prostitution. Yeah. So we strongly believe that the ANC 
in that regard I'm out of touch with women on the ground who would be and across society remember South Africa is a conservative society that would mean that decriminalizes prostitution and I think that's the reason why we are not seeing it come before the justice portfolio committee yeah, yeah. and um, you know, most people is against it our research shows that so, Steve, uh, we run out of time. I want to thank you once again for coming on to the program. Thank you for the great work you're doing in Parliament, Justice Portfolio Committee, the Finance Portfolio Committee. We thank God that you are there speaking biblical values and standing up for what is right. God bless you and good night to you. Thank you.